Thank you. Um, first of all, I apologize for the hat. Uh, I'm actually from Boston. Uh, I was worried that uh, my head would burst into flames when I put this on this morning, but uh, we were all cool and all kids. Um, there was big news on Wall Street this week. Uh, huge, enormous news. Probably a lot of folks didn't hear about it because there were some other uh, news events of major importance this week. Uh, the, uh, obviously, the healthcare ruling at the Supreme Court, uh, Tom and Katie's divorce, among other things. Um, but there was an enormous scandal uh, that became public uh, this week in Wall Street. And uh, very few people know about it as yet. Um, it turns out that even the most fundamental building blocks of our economy have been corrupted. And we found this out when uh, a pair of the world's biggest banks, uh, Barclays and the Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, settled with uh, governments in several different countries. There were enormous settlements. Barclays settled for $450 million. And they both admitted to manipulating something called LIBOR. Um, LIBOR is a London Air Bank this is essentially the rate at which banks borrow from each other. And almost every uh, variable rate investment in the world is tied to life. It's like the sum at the center of the investment universe. $10 trillion of loans worldwide are pegged to life. Uh, does anybody here have a credit card? All right, how about a mortgage? Anybody here have a mortgage? Anybody here have a pension? Oh, we have actually. So all of these things are pegged, uh, or many of these things are pegged to LIBOR. It's a variable rate credit card. Typically, it's based on LIBOR. So instead of it being an 8% credit card, it'll be LIBOR plus 8%. LIBOR plus 9%. When LIBOR goes up, you pay more for your credit card bill. More importantly, uh, cities and towns all over the world, uh, virtually every city and town in the United States, including cities like Philadelphia, they have vast holdings, uh, investment holdings, that are tied to LIBOR. Uh, so when LIBOR goes down, when the rate of LIBOR goes down, cities and towns earn less. They have less money to pay for public services. They can't sweep their streets. They can't hire policemen or fire firefighters. They have to lay out teachers and they have to close hospitals. All these things happen when even the tiniest uh, change is made to the LIBOR rate. Uh, a, a fraction of a point, uh, LIBOR manipulated downward can result in tens of billions of dollars of losses worldwide. Or hundreds of billions of dollars of losses. So what did we find out this past week? Uh, we found out that the banks had been manipulating this rate artificially downward. How did they do this? How did LIBOR work? I promise I won't do too much of this inside baseball stuff. I promised my wife I would keep it simple today. Uh, but how do they do this? Every morning, there's a committee, uh, a British-based committee called the British, British Bankers Association. And, uh, and they call up, the British, the British Bankers Association calls up 16 of the biggest banks in the world, and they basically ask them, uh, how much are, people, are other banks charging you today to borrow? And what they do is they take each of those numbers every morning, they make this call at about 11 o'clock every morning, they take those numbers, uh, they gather them together, they average them out, and that turns into LIBOR. So what did the banks do? Um, they got together and they decided amongst themselves, the biggest companies, financial companies in the world, and they made, a, they made an agreement. They said, when that guy calls every morning at 11 o'clock, we're going to lie to him. Uh, we're going to tell him, 
uh, that it cost us less, uh, that we charged each other less to borrow money. Uh, and this is what they did. Um, and why did they do this? Because, well, they have the opposite situation of most cities and towns in the world. Most banks, most of the time, their portfolios actually lose value as LIBOR goes up. So they artificially manipulated the rate, the, the rate of LIBOR to make more money for themselves personally. And we found out through these settlements, when they released uh, the information in the Department of Justice here in the United States, regulators in, in, uh, in Britain, when they released these settlements today, or uh, last week, we they released all this evidence. Uh, they released all this evidence um, uh, about how they discovered this manipulation of LIBOR, and they had these amazing things, uh, including transcripts of communications between traders at Barclays and the guy at Barclays who submits the numbers to LIBOR. And he essentially, we had these, these conversations where the trader said, hey, you know, we're, our portfolio today is a little bit unbalanced. Uh, we're going to get hit especially hard if LIBOR is high today. So we want you to push it downward. You literally use those words, push it downward. And in the transcripts, we hear the LIBOR submitter, and he's basically saying, sure, how long do you want me to do that for? Um, and this is an incredible thing. It, the, the, the scale of it is almost unprecedented uh, in, in the history of financial corruption. Um, yeah. In order to, manipulating LIBOR downward for, to make their portfolios better, when I was trying to think of uh, a metaphor to explain what this is like, uh, these guys have just uh, rigged the numbers so that they can make a couple of extra points that day and stealing from every city and every town and every major developed country in the world to do it, it's literally, it's like melting the melting Antarctica to water your lawn. Uh, that's what these guys were doing. And we found out that they were doing this. Um, one other additional aspect of the scandal that I want to bring up before I get to my point. Uh, when they do this every day, when they take, when they make those phone calls to those 16 banks, um, they call 16 companies and they throw out the four highest numbers and the four lowest numbers every day. And then they take the eight numbers in between and average those out and make that into live work. Now why is that important? It's important because that means it couldn't just be two banks that were doing this. Uh, if it was just two banks that were involved in this, they wouldn't have any effect on LIBOR. It has to be at least four. Uh, it's probably more like six or seven. And some people think that when all the information comes out in the end, we're going to find out that every single one of those 16 banks has been doing this for years and years and years. Uh, there are investigations ongoing. In, in four different countries, and all the major suspects have been implicated. Uh, Bank of America, who's a favorite, of course, of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, whose CEO, of course, was testifying a couple days ago in Congress. Uh, Citigroup, all the usual suspects. So what does this mean? Why is this significant? Well, think back, what did they say last year when the Occupy movement started? What are some of the things they said about your protests and why you came out. Well, first they said, obviously, they said you were communist. They always say that. Uh, secondly, they said a lot of you came out because you were jealous. You were simply jealous of rich people. Uh, other people said they're out there protesting because they really want a hand out, right? That was, that was what was said often in the press. Middle-aged, rich, white kids. Middle-aged, rich, white kids, exactly. Kids and child, children of privilege who need to take a shower. That was another thing we heard a lot, right? Uh, but the most consistent criticism that we heard was that the Occupy protesters were in denial, that they were afraid to face reality. And what was the reality that you all were allegedly afraid to face? The reality was that some people were successful and you are not. That was always the implication of the, of the, of the criticism, right? Is that what they always said? Well, it turns out, we find out through this LIBOR scandal and other scandals like a municipal bid rigging thing that I, I wrote about last week and some other things, that actually the situation is completely reversed. Uh, that actually it's these bankers, it's these companies on Wall Street who are afraid of reality. Uh, in capitalist terms, they showed the worst kind of cowardice because they were afraid not just of their own images, but they were afraid of the real cost of things. They were afraid of prices. Uh, so they got together, and rather than let the world know 
how much uh, things really cost, how much it really costs for them to borrow money, uh, rather than let them know, let everybody know what kind of financial shape they were in, they got together and they essentially Botoxed themselves. They, they, they rubbed out their balance sheets and they faked the numbers because they were afraid of reality. Uh, and again, this is exactly the opposite of what we heard last year. They said, all of you hated capitalism, right? That was why you came out. You couldn't deal with capitalism. You couldn't deal with the realities of capitalism. But it turns out that these banks, actually, they're the ones that are afraid of capitalism. Uh, they're afraid of real prices. Um, and capitalism, obviously, for all its problems, it does have real capitalism. The true free market has some genuine democratic qualities. Uh, in, true, in true capitalism, two dollars in a poor man's pocket is always worth one dollar, more than one dollar in a rich man's pocket, right? That's always true. But what they, the system that they contrived uh, to organize was different. This was a whole bunch of rich guys who kept their hands over their pockets and said, trust us, we've got three dollars in there. And that's what they did. They, they rigged the game so that no matter what happens, they always win. And we have a word for this uh, when people who are supposed to be competing stop competing and they start cooperating. We have a word for it when people are afraid of democracy, they're afraid of free competition, when they get together and they rig the games so that they always win and we always lose. And the word for that is oligarchy. And that's, that's the situation that we're in right now. Uh, and it's much worse than we thought. You know, a few years ago when this scandal broke, we thought this was just a story about individual corruption within banks. But it turns out that it's organized corruption, that, that it's systemic corruption, that this is a vast political problem. I mean, this goes beyond a simple corruption problem. What it almost becomes almost like a metaphysical problem. If LIBOR, which is in everything, it's, it's in the very DNA of the entire economy. If LIBOR is not a real number, and it calls into question the very fabric of the financial universe. Uh, if that's fake, almost everything is fake. And we're presented with this enormous challenge about what do we do about this oligarchical system, this entrenched oligarchical system. And that's what we're apparently uh, uh, Occupy is, is for. That's what we're here to discuss is what do we do next. Um, and clearly we, it's, it's our responsibility now so what do we do? Uh, well, how about throwing them in jail? How does that sound to anybody? Yeah. Absolutely. If we can, we should definitely throw them in jail. Uh, things like uh, manipulation of LIBOR. I was talking to a trader on Wall Street last week, and he said if uh, the CEO of Barclays, uh, if he was an Italian mobster, if his name was Defazio, 800 years of RICO charges, uh, and it would, that it would have been done last week. Uh, instead, uh, we have a situation where they're going to pay, pay fines. They're going to be relatively stiff fines for, for Wall Street, but nobody's going to go to jail. So the very existence of this kind of organized corruption, this, this, uh, this very uh, uh, powerful and effective and disciplined kind of corruption, it probably precludes the government just saving us by throwing them all in jail and starting over. It's just not going to happen. It's a good thing if it does happen, but it's probably not going to happen. So yeah, better law enforcement, that would be great. Um, regulations, uh, I'm of the mind that the existing laws would probably work if we, if we enforce them, but we might need some new rules to prevent this sort of thing. Uh, but is that going to fix the problem? Uh, probably not, because this goes deeper, again, it's deeper than a crime problem. Uh, you, as all of you know, and as those people who are sitting up there in jail tonight know, uh, you can't solve problems uh, with cops and rules. Uh, that's not true. You have to solve problems in the hearts of people. Uh, and the situation that we have now uh, is a, is, speaks to a profound sickness uh, in the soul of American society. Uh, just think about what they did, and then think about Show of hands, how many people mugged an old lady on the way to this rally? <laughs> Just this guy, okay. Did we not? Did all of you not mug old ladies because it was against the law? Maybe because you were afraid of getting caught? Were you afraid the police were going to catch you? No, you just don't mug old ladies because you just don't. Uh, <laughs> We don't steal from people, we don't hurt people, because we want to stay part of society. We want to be part of the, 
of the human community. And when you steal from people, when you hurt people, you become an outcast. Uh, you're, you become alone. Uh, and most of us are not willing to do that because we have uh, a connection to other people. But which raises the question of how did this happen on Wall Street? Because that's exactly what they were doing, is stealing from old ladies. Uh, forget about forget about the LIBOR scandal, forget, forget about all this new stuff. Think about what, hap what happened before 2008 with the mortgage-backed security scandal. Um, what was that scandal all about? It was about big banks, big companies, taking toxic, worthless mortgage-backed securities and selling it to, among other people, uh, State pension funds. So you had ordinary working uh, people who worked hard jobs. They were toll collectors or cops or firemen their whole lives. They saved up money, uh, and then in the end, a bank comes in and they sell them a bunch of bonds that they know are going to blow up in a couple of years because they know how those bonds were made. Uh, that's stealing the life savings of old ladies and old men. Uh, and it wasn't just we'd understand if a couple of random diabolical sociopathic criminals, if a, if a couple of Bernie Madoff types had done this, we would understand that because accidents, genetic accidents happen. You're never going to get everybody uh, to, to fall in line. But this wasn't that. This was systemic. This was everybody on Wall Street. Uh, there was 10, 20,000 college-educated professionals openly, willingly doing this and not really having a second thought about it. And so how does that happen? Um, clearly, the fault is theirs, clearly, mostly. Uh, but we have to ask ourselves whether some of this is on us. And it has to be. Uh, because clearly, society has been neglected to some degree. If, if enough people have lost that sense of community, uh, then, then some of this has to be on us. We must be responsible for some of that neglect. Uh, and put it another way, Yes, all these banks, yes, they manipulated the political system. Yes, they bought off politicians, right? They did do that. They, they sent armies of lobbyists to Washington to, to change and manipulate the rules in their favor. Uh, they did all these things. They, they gamed the system. But on the other hand, some of that is on us because we allowed ourselves to think that just voting once every four years was all the responsibility we had to take for making the world the way we wanted it to be. Uh, and so we were left in this situation. We, we willingly opted for this sort of hands-off style of citizenship, and they enabled us to do that. Um, and when we did that, when we retreated, and when we became sort of couch potato citizens who let other people make our decisions for us, uh, they, they, we created a kind of void, a vacuum, a power vacuum. And they stepped into that void. Uh, very cleverly, very in a very organized way, they stepped into that wood and they decided to make our decisions for us. They created products that made it easier for, for us to have that hands-off relationship. Uh, you know, in the old days, when you wanted to get a mortgage, uh, you had to know your banker, right? Uh, you had to know he had to know who you were. Uh, he had to be comfortable with what kind of person you were before he was going to give you a loan. Well, they Wall Street came in, in the last 10, 20 years, and they invented new products that made it possible for us to get huge mortgages without talking to a human being at all. We can just call an 800 number or click something on the internet. They offered us those products and we bought them. Uh, credit cards. In the old days you had to know you were a local restaurant owner, uh, the, the, the local store owner before he would give you a tab, right? Uh, but that changed with credit cards. Uh, they would just send you stuff in the mail, credit cards in the mail, you filled out a form. And suddenly you didn't have to talk to anybody. Not only do you not have to know the restaurant owner, you don't even have to know your credit card company. Uh, it's a completely impersonal uh, system, and we willingly participated in it. And even worse, and I'm getting to the end, uh, when our cities and towns got into trouble, and we were, when we were faced with really, really difficult decisions, economic decisions, uh, when we had budget problems, and the choice was we have to either raise taxes or we have to cut services, we have to lay people off, um, Wall Street came to us and it said, hey, you know what? You don't have to make that decision right now. We're going to finance that problem away for you. We're going we're gonna to sell you a swap that will allow you to push that problem 10 years into the future, 20 years into the future. So you don't have to make that decision. Your kids can make that decision. Your grandkids can make that decision. And some of us said, you know what? That's a pretty good deal. And a lot of us didn't know we were, we were saying that, but we did. We elected the politicians who made those calls and we didn't ask any questions about how we were getting along. Where did the money come from? 
Yeah, we all knew we were in a recession. We all knew the times were tough. Everybody was losing their jobs. And yet somehow we didn't have to tighten our belts all that much, uh, or as much as we, sh we thought we should have, probably. And so that's on us. So we have to do better. We have to be involved more. And clearly that's what Occupy is all about. It's kind of the collective realization that we have to do more than vote, right? Uh, and and that's, what we're, that's what we're doing. And it's kind of a cool thing to see. Um, you know, an example, in the old days when the SEC created new rules, uh, they would ask the public to submit comments uh, so that they could find out how to tweak the rules and what was best and what was, what was not a good idea. And in the old days, the only people who ever submitted comments were the banks and their lawyers and their lobbyists. And they would submit thousands of comments and they got the rules that they wanted. We never participated in that process. Well, now we have Occupy the SEC, uh, which writes 100-page comment letters to new regulations that come out. Because we're recognizing that we have to be part of this bureaucracy. There's just no other way. Otherwise, we're going to lose. Um, the old days, think tanks, all think tanks were corporate funded. They were the American Enterprise Institute, the RAND Institute. It was big money that moved public opinion. They were the ones who created the ideas that became laws and shaped our society. And we never participated in that. Uh, and now Occupy itself is becoming like a giant people's think tank. Uh, we're creating new ideas that are going to move society in a direction that's better for all of us, that's better for society. And that's a great thing. And so that's, that's how we win. Yeah, clearly we need, to, we need new laws, we need to, to enforce the law when we can. But more importantly, we just have to be involved, we have to take more responsibility for ourselves. When we do that, we succeed. And when we don't do that, the converse is, when we live selfishly, we lose. And the reason we lose is because we lose the moral argument. When we live selfishly, Wall Street kind of calls our bluff. And it says, yeah, okay, you know, you're complaining that we ripped off that old lady, but what did you ever do for that old lady? Uh, and that's what they say. And that's, that's kind of their argument. Yes, we're selfish, but so are you, and we're just better at it. Uh, <laughs> that was their argument last year. That's what, that, that's why, that's what they meant when they said, you're all just jealous of us, they essentially meant, we're just better at doing the same stuff that you're doing. We're better at ignoring society than you are. Anyway, so clearly we have to do the opposite. We have to turn the tables on them, and we have to create a society that's so great and so vital that they'll be ashamed to mess it up the way they have in the last 20 years or so. And so everybody being here today and being involved in Occupy across the country, uh, that's a great first step in that direction. And anyway, I'm, I'm very honored to be taking that step with you, and uh, thank you very much. You have to nail down um, you know, the, the cost of the actual financing before you can figure out whether it's a good price or not. So that's really hard. I almost impressed me. It's really hard. Like the bid rigging thing I wrote about, right? The way they the way they stole in that situation is they essentially um, they overcharge the towns for uh, for swap fees and then split the, the fee with the middleman company the towns hired to hold the auctions, right? And so there there would be no way to look at all the paperwork and figure that out. You just have to you would have to be in on it to not to figure it out. And that took a court case. Right, exactly. That, that took somebody out. like confessing and saying, oh, by this is what we did, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's tough. I so mean, someone even with your skills couldn't get into that. I'm definitely not my skills. I mean, you I, got a lot more than pro that. probably <laughs> like a bank examiner could probably look at, oh, yeah. and if he was familiar with the market, he would probably be able to say, you know, that looks a little bit expensive or that that doesn't look right or, or who is this who is this consultant? That's another thing a lot of a lot of these companies do is they get they get the towns to hire a consultant, an investment banking consultant, and that will be another fee that will be in there somewhere and you have to figure out what is, what's that consultant for and so it but it's a whole mess. I mean I don't know that beauty world all that well but it's it's a big sewer. So. Well, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what do you introduce lately? I think it was Zionist last week we were talking about there was a trial. And you know, the jury was sort of nodding off. Right. Was, meanwhile, if it was a case and somebody stole a hundred bucks with somebody with a gun, they'd be all over. Right, you right. Know, talking about a hundred million. You know, it's like, how do you? I mean, they make it complicated purposes. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. I That's guess clearly. Talk about it, enough people will realize there's the problem. 
But you know what? The, the thing is, in that case, they actually got a conviction, which was a great thing because a lot of these prosecutors, you know, and I've asked this question, how, how come you guys aren't bringing these cases? You know, I mean, it's not like there's no evidence, you know, they, like in the, you know, the Goldman case, you have all these emails where the guys are laughing about, you know, how we screwed this person and that person. How come we're not bringing that case? And they always say, well, you know, we're afraid that we're going to go take this to court and, and the juries aren't going to understand it. And so we don't want to lose, right? You know, there was a famous case right after the crash happened with Bear Stearns where a bunch of guys from Bear Stearns ripped off, uh, you know, their investors in a hedge fund. And they, they thought they had these guys dead to rights because there were all these emails. They took it to court and they lost. And after that, they never tried again, the, the, the Justice Department. So, I, but, you know, the case that I just covered is sort of proof that people aren't completely stupid. I mean, people, Maybe it's yeah. getting through, like, right. getting the way the money is. Also, there's a political aspect to it, which is that prosecutors know that if they send a bunch of, you know, black kids with guns to jail, that's a good headline, and they're going to they're gonna get elected. But if, you know, if they lose a really arcane financial case, uh, not only are they going to lose funding when they run for office, but it's not that great of a headline. It just doesn't, it doesn't look to people, it's not as sexy, and so they, that's another reason they don't take it. Read your articles, though. I mean, yeah, there not is so that many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta keep them tag lights coming like the vampire squid. Oh. <laughs> they keep them tag. Oh, right, right, right. I'll work on it. Yeah. <laughs> CDO is low grade of Amer uh, 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 Oregano. That was a you look into this Eric Holder thing with the uh, with this guys, the company that the law firm that he used to work for. Oh uh, no, this, uh, I haven't. Yeah, yeah, what was that all about again? Well, the, the, Eric Holder used to work for Covington. Uh -huh. Covington represents the big banks. Uh -huh. the, the Justice Department has not prosecuted any of the big banks. Oh right, and yeah. I'm wondering if there's any conflict of interest there. Well, I mean that's that's kind of the problem with why they're not prosecuting all these guys is because. Every single one of the, the the main regulators, the people who sit in the, the chief regulatory offices, they all uh, either have worked for the law firm, the, the big corporate defense firms for Wall Street, or they're going to. Uh, you know, and when you leave, like the head of the SEC enforcement division, um, you know there's a there's a partnership for waiting for you at a, at a firm like Wilmer Hale, uh, where you're going to make two or three million dollars a year, right? So if you know that, if you know that that job is out there for you, how hard are you really going to hit Citigroup or, or Goldman Sachs? It's kind of like, you know, the analogy I always use is, it's like kids in college, they know they got that first NBA contract waiting for them. You know, are you really going to you know, give every NBA team the middle finger while you're in college? You're not. You're going you're gonna to be a good soldier, and that's that's what these guys do. That's why I think that's a, that's a big, big factor in why they're not. Like Bob, Bob Kuzami, right, he's the current head of the SEC's enforcement division. His last job was as Deutsche Bank's general counsel. And when he was Deutsche Bank's general counsel, he was overseeing exactly the same kind of crooked CDO deals that Goldman got busted for last year. Well, there's been no case against Deutsche, and there's just not gonna be, and you know, so that, that's kind of the problem. Um, you know, we've all moved our money and, you know, into, I, 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 the small local institutions, I'm just wondering how, much connection is there between like you know small local banks or, or uh, credit unions and the big Wall Street banks? I mean, it, uh, have we really moved our money? Have we really yeah, no. it out? Yeah, you're doing the right thing. Definitely. Yeah, no, I, I get that, but yeah. is, is, is there what kind of connections are there between there's like small actually, regional banks actually, and Wall Street? Right? There's actually a really there's, there's a very real dichotomy between small regional banks, credit unions on the one hand, and too big to fail banks on the other. On the other hand, because they're at odds with each other. Um, too big to fail. What does it mean? It means that these companies, everybody knows that these companies are never going to go out of business, right? So if everybody, all these investors know that, uh, then they will um, charge less to, uh, le uh, to to lend to those banks. Uh, so when these banks go out and borrow money in the world, they don't have to pay as much as some small regional bank or some credit union does. Because everybody knows that no matter what happens, the government's going to come in and pay, pay off, they're going to get their money back. So that means that all these companies have an inherent uh, competitive advantage over your small regional bank. 
uh, be, because in banking, cost of capital is everything. If you're if if it costs less for you to borrow and it costs more for these guys to borrow, they're always going to lose, and these guys are always going to win. So there's this kind of growing tension between these guys and those guys. And so when you move, the problem is moving to these these banks doesn't have a huge impact, unfortunately, because the big their big source of money is always going to be the Federal Reserve, uh, or you know, when these guys, everyone here see the movie Goodfellas. Yeah. And, they, and they always talked about hey, whenever we wanted money, we just robbed the airport, right? That's what they said. <laughs> these guys, whenever they want to make money, they just create a bunch of mortgages and they sell them to Fannie and Freddie. Because that customer is always there. That's all they ever have to do. And they, they're not really dependent upon your money uh, the way banks used to be. So that's a problem. But you should still move it. Yeah. I mean, so. Um, we've got negative net effective interest rates at this point. We take the interest rate on treasuries and we net out inflation. Um, and we've got investors all over the world kind of sitting on the sidelines or in offshore taxing. Um, is there any way to seize assets? Any way to seize assets? Yeah. Like all the offshore uh, offshore funds. Yeah. Interestingly, this is what she's asking if there's any way to seize. I mean, they're, they're basically waiting on the sidelines for something, right? Right. Either better investment rates. I guess. Or, yeah. Or tax, or tax holiday. Right. They're. It's just it's just not as profitable for them to lend to some small business as it is to, you know, buy a bunch of credit default swaps and you know do all those crazy financial machinations right. that So yeah, they, the, a lot of that money is just sitting there. You know, when they, when we had the bailouts, I talked to, I think he's a Pennsylvania congressman, Paul Kanjorski, uh, and he was saying, you know, when we did these bailouts, we had an implicit deal with these guys, which was, we're gonna make you well again, we're gonna give you all like this giant mountain of money, and when you get it, you gotta lend it out to the economy, you gotta create jobs, you gotta make things happen again. But what they did, that, that's exactly what they didn't do. They they just sat on it and they turned it into bonuses. And it was so bad that uh, in the first quarter of 2009, which was like 10 minutes after the crash, right, uh, all of the banks were immediately giving themselves gigantic bonus pools again. Uh, you know, Goldman had like a four billion dollar bonus pool that right. that and quarter, and they weren't lending. There was like no, there was zero lending. So we just gave them all this money and they took it. Uh, and it was so, it was so bad that they ended up having to print with quantitative easing, print new money. Uh, and the Federal Reserve had to go out and buy stuff and, and invest instead of instead of the banks. They went out and they bought mortgages, they bought treasuries to try to stimulate the economy. So these guys are definitely sitting on money that's not really theirs, that they're supposed to be using to create jobs and they're not doing it. Um, it's interesting that you point out that whole idea of seizing the money. Um, there are, there's a new movement that's about to start where some towns are going to use eminent domain uh, to seize mortgages, uh, bad mortgages in their towns. Uh, they're just going to take the loans, uh, not the properties, but the loans. They're going to seize those bonds back from, from the uh, from the banks, uh, and that's going to be the first test of whether that kind of approach is going to work. San Bernardino, California is going to do that in September. It's going to be a cool thing. So what, what does it do that, you know, when they take the, uh, the mortgage? When they take the mortgage? Yes. Well, right now, these mortgages are sitting there, and all these people are underwater, right? right. And they can't right. get rid of their houses, right? right. Uh, so what they're gonna, what, what these towns are going to do, and it's creating all these problems in light, you know, that uh, people get foreclosed upon, they don't fix their houses up, and so everybody's property value goes down. These towns are going to seize the properties, they're going to seize the properties, and then they're going to offer uh, to allow these people to, to sell, to buy them back at a lower cost. At the market. So, okay. At, yeah, at the market rate. So they're they're going to be new mortgage companies that are coming in. So if your house is you bought it for 300, it's now worth 200. The towns are going to come in. They're going to seize the mortgage, and they're going to let allow you to come back and buy your own house back for 200 thousand uh, dollars. So this is a great thing because. Uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like taking off the band-aid. I mean, it, Wall Street is holding on to these bonds. They, they already have figured in the losses. They already know that they're not worth that much anymore. But they're afraid to kind of like recognize that it's happened. And so the towns are going to force them to recognize those losses. And it'll get everybody out from underwater, hopefully. Has that been reported? Like is that Very, very little. There have been a few stories. It's kind of not out of the bag yet, but it's going to happen. Is there somebody in Champaign or Dino that did it? Um, That's exciting. 
write me in a couple of weeks. I'll, okay. I'll, I can probably help you with that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you tell me uh, what your understanding is and why there were no conditions or expectations when all that money was given to you? That, that could be followed up on. In other words, how come? I mean, if I was loaning money to anybody, I would right. be thinking in terms of the term. Right, I mean, right. Like, what, what, what's the giving back? Uh, why weren't any of those things put in practice? Or, you know, like, why don't we know about Well, right. I mean, like when you get a credit card, right? Yeah. It's like it's like 18 pages long. There's all these like conditions. Right, exactly. If you do this, you know that this will happen. You know, if you scratch your nose. Well, they basically put a gun to the head of Congress, and when Hank Paulson, who was the Treasury Secretary at the time, he presented Congress with a three-page document. It was, you have to give us 750 billion dollars immediately, and he also said. Um, uh, nobody can ever be prosecuted. There can never, be, never be any regulatory oversight of any of this money, uh, and it didn't. They rejected that plan, but they ended up getting something that was sort of like that. There was really no oversight of it. Um, you know, that's up. That's on your. That's on your congressman, basically, for, for let, allowing that to happen. Anybody else? Just a couple more. Yeah. So uh, the Federal Reserve lends money to banks who lend money theoretically to people. Is right. there some reason why the Federal Reserve can't just lend money to people and yeah, skip the banks entirely? That, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, like after the, uh, after the crash, the Fed created all these programs that were quote unquote designed to stimulate the economy, designed to stimulate consumer credit, uh, to save the auto industry. Uh, there were, like for instance, there was a, a program called TALF, right? Uh, trouble, I forget what it stands for. Anyway, TALF was basically the Fed would give loans, uh, would give money to banks, and then banks would use that money to uh, allow people to buy car loans, right, for instance. But their reasoning was, we don't have the infrastructure to administer all these loans, so we have to hire all these banks to find the worthy lender, worthy borrowers. And what they did is, so so they essentially, in all, in all these programs, they get their money for zero, right? And then they lend it to us at five or 10 or whatever it is. And it's just, it's just free money. I mean, in some of these cases, the Fed, these banks are getting money from the Fed at zero, and then they're going out and they're lending it back to the U.S. government at two or three uh, percent. So they're going out and they're buying treasury bonds. It's li it's like the um, you ever see Beavis and Butthead where they're like, you know, can you like give us some money? You know. <laughs> We're gonna lend you money so you can lend it back to us at interest. You know, it's crazy, and, and like the Fed really doesn't have the infrastructure to do that. I mean, I'm sure they could create those programs, but they should definitely impose harsher terms on the banks. They shouldn't have this gigantic profit margin, uh, which they do. Just right. one more, yes. What, in reporting all this stuff? Yeah. I think, I mean, uh, I, I think there are a lot of reporters who are really into this stuff, and just the, the, the problem with it is that it's boring. You know, uh, there's just no way to do it on TV uh, that's <laughs> exciting. I mean, people want to watch, like, you know, girls from New Jersey, you know, hitting each other with pillows and bikinis. You know, they don't, they don't want to listen to, you know, guaranteed investment contracts and <laughs> it just doesn't you, you can't sell you know snickers to this stuff uh so it's a real problem in, in that sense and there's there on a in newspapers there, there's almost no you can't do this stuff in 500 words you need you need 2,000 3,000 words to do a lot of this stuff and there, there's like limited uh news outlets that have the ability to even talk about it so it's a problem definitely but i think I think people are get coming around to it. I mean, uh, especially there, there's definitely more in the financial press. There's like been a shift in attitudes in the last couple of years where a lot of the reporters from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times who gave these guys the benefit of the doubt at first, like they, they, they've, they've gone over there and they're, they're gunning for them now. I mean, even the New York Times has done a pretty, pretty excellent job uh, where they were on the sidelines at first. So there's hope, there's definitely hope. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. I got waiting for